Yes, although, uh, Sean, one, one of what we have seen here in Arizona is it is not just white students choosing to go to school with more white students. Certainly that is, that is the case, and I think that uh, idea of white, of white flight um, we have seen historically. However, in the school choice movement here in Arizona, we see that many racial ethnic groups, when choosing schools, in other words, when they go from a district school to a charter school, go to school with more students like themselves. Let me give you an example. Asian students in Arizona make up about 3% of the population. They, however, are about 5% of the population in charter schools. However, there are specific charter schools that have over 25% of their student population that is Asian. Um, we have seen similar din dynamics with um, black students who go to charter schools, really centered around churches who are, who are promoting specific okay, David, charter schools. OK, David, just school. explain that to us. What is a charter school? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, a charter school is a is an independent uh, it's a independent public school. So it's a public school that is in existence as a result of a charter or an agreement with the state to follow compliance, uh, state and say, federal and uh, fire compliances. But in exchange uh, for some autonomy, they get uh, some more. They get autonomy, but they also are held more accountable in ways in the sense that they are out in a competitive market. In other words, if if parents do not choose to go to, these, to a charter school, they close down as a result of low student enrollment. And um, we saw But we out also of, have uh, the problem. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, we also ahead, have Patricia. the problem. We also have the pro problem that in charter schools, they're not held to any kinds of civil rights um, uh, monitoring, and so they have been allowed to enroll only white or only uh, African American or only Latino students without any real supervision. And that's one of the ways in which uh, they have gotten around what might otherwise be attempts at desegregating schools. Uh, I, however, wanted to make a point, though, too, about the, uh, the fact that it isn't just socioeconomics. Um, there's, it is also a fact that white students who are low income are more likely to go to school in middle class schools than, uh, than poor children who are black or Latino, who are more likely to go to, even when they're middle class, more likely to go to low income schools. So much of this has to do with housing segregation in neighborhoods. So Patricia, you're saying now, if suppose a black kid who comes from a low income neighborhood wants to go to a middle class school, would, could that, that kid won't be necessarily stopped, but there would be difficulties getting to that school. Things like distance, uh, yes, transport. Yes, yeah. because, yes, they're not required to provide transportation. They're not required to provide information to those families. And it can be very, very difficult for these families to send their children to another part of the city or a, another area when they have no transportation and may, in fact, not even be aware of those opportunities. Corin, when we get back to the impact unless, that segregation, uh, uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say, unless the kid is athletically gifted, then all of a sudden it becomes in the best interest of that school to find a way to get that athletically gifted black kid across town, no matter what it takes to play basketball or football, uh, to raise sort of the athletic profile of the school. It's quite a paradox that really you know, underscores the self-interest of, of schools that are predominantly white. Right, and Corin, when we look at the impact that segregation is having on students of color, uh, many of the researchers, many of the investigators who've looked into this found that in schools with a predominantly African-American or Hispanic uh, school population, um, there are disproportionately fewer courses offered in things like math and science and college prep. So these students, ultimately, I would imagine, have a lot of difficulty getting into colleges and universities. Well, and that is absolutely true. Yeah. Sorry, Curran, go ahead. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Um, well, that's true. Mm -hmm. And we know that that historically is the case, that the kid, we find that kids, when they get to college, are not perhaps as prepared as their white counterparts might be. Um, I happen to work in a middle school that is a STEM school, but I've worked also in a high school. And we, and we happen to do a pretty good job in preparing kids for that. But we now, do a realize- A STEM school is one that prepares kids it's, it's for For the idea of science, technology, education, in terms of math and math too and so it's the whole idea of we're, we're integrating all those things that we know are part of the careers of the future and we realize that we receive kids who are not on grade level and so we do a lot of work to build up that gap 
Um, and again, that gap goes back to how prepared our parents are to support their kids. Um, and that goes back to, as Sean said, generations of us being disenfranchised and an unequal playing field. And so it's real, like kids are not prepared and we know it and we're trying our best to do something about it. So a kid wants to go to university or go to college, applies mm -hmm. to these institutions, that kid's gonna be handicapped. Absolutely, Ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I can speak for myself. Um, I'm. Um, single parent. I'm, a, I'm from a single parent uh, from North New Jersey. My mother worked three jobs to put me through school. And I went to a pretty good high school, but I even got there realizing that I did not have all the skills that I needed. Right. So I played my own catch up to be prepared for college. Um, so I know it's real. And that takes a lot of effort on the part of an individual. Sean, what are the barriers to integration in schools in the United States? Well, certainly racism is one real barrier, um, as is classism and sort of the um, inequitable distribution of wealth and how that plays itself out residentially. Um, you know, the segregation that we see in schools, um, the point was made earlier, is oftentimes a reflection of the segregation that we see in residential neighborhoods. So that's certainly one barrier. I think another barrier is that we don't have a comprehensive modern day desegregation plan. Um, you know, certainly Brown and other legislation from 60 years ago gave us a blueprint and gave us, you know, a, a real serious sort of national imperative. I don't know that we feel that, si that same sense of imperative right now. And, and I, I, think, I think that we should, right? Because if we don't, it is going to be highly consequential for the future of the United States. Well, let's talk I about think another. Ed, the, go ahead. I think another, uh, yeah. another, another barrier is just simple awareness among our legislators. Here in Arizona, the, our last legislative session, uh, there was a very strong attempt to strip desegregation funds from our local school districts. Uh, these are important federally mandated funds that allow for programs to uh, desegregate, uh, to have more integration in our schools. And the rationale was that we were past this. We had already desegregated our schools, the point was done, and that the uh, funds weren't needed anymore. Right, and Patricia, are there federal programs that promote integration? Because, I mean, one can understand uh, or just acknowledge that there are states that are very, very conservative with right-wing administrations where there may be de, de facto segregation. But what about the federal government? What can the federal government do? I mean, you've got a president right now who's African-American. What's being done? Well, you know, the federal government actually has its hands tied in many ways by the Supreme Court. We had a decision just a few years ago called Parents Involved in which uh, schools that were districts that were voluntarily choosing to desegregate their, uh, their schools uh, were not allowed to do so if they were going to use race as a factor in the desegregation. Now, that's uh, somewhat absurd, right? If you're trying to desegregate racially, how can you not consider race in doing so? But our hands have been tied tremendously over the last many years by, the, by a very, very conservative Supreme Court, which has bit by bit totally undone Brown. And I would, I would also mention undone Mendes, and I would like to set the record straight on this, that Brown was not the first desegregation suit. But in 1946, the Mendes case in California made, desegregation, uh, made segregation illegal in California. Karen, what do you hear from the parents of African-American students at schools which are under-resourced where there is a high level of discrimination? Well, what I, what I hear from parents who want their children to do well is they're asking for the resources to do it because they don't have them and they don't know how. That's what I'm really hearing, that parents, just like any parents, want their children to do well and they just don't know how to get to that. That is the bigger conversation that happens on the ground level that I see. Um, and, we're, and we try our best to, to meet those needs. Um, something as simple as 
you know, providing clothes for kids who may come into that situation and not have it, and parents being open and honest to tell us about that. Um, those are the things that no one's really talking about. Um, we have a lot of kids who are homeless because of um, what Patricia and Sean were talking about, about these ha housing patterns, and especially in D.C., where we have gentrification, and parents are actually being pushed out of their neighborhoods and trying to find a way to still get their kids to school, even though they may not live there anymore because they can't afford to live there anymore. So those are the real conversations that's happening on the ground level about how do I get my kids to school, how do I get my kid these resources, how do I get my kids clothes, and I don't think we're having enough conversations about that. So, Sean, how so, big a priority yeah. is overhauling the education system for, let's say, the federal government? Um, I mean, we hear in surveys that you know, when you talk to, we have an election right now, we get all these surveys. People say, look, the economy is a big priority. Other people say health care is a big priority. Where does education fit in? You know, we don't often hear education um, among the top priorities that people list, especially in the election discourse. Um, and even the candidates themselves, you know, will sometimes say that, you know, we're so committed to education, but yet, you know, it doesn't sort of rise to the level of importance uh, in their rhetoric and in the things that they talk about in their stump speeches. Here's where I give a very serious nod to the Obama administration. Uh, particularly when we're talking about things like school discipline and um, college opportunity, you know, they have definitely raised the level of national conversation about the importance of narrowing racial gaps and class gaps in, in education in a refreshing way. So, you know, I, I really hope that the next president and her administration can really help to advance um, you know, the really good progress that the Obama administration has made around these issues. I think he's talking about one the possibility of, the of Sean one, mentioned. President Clinton President, there. Yeah, right. Go ahead, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that Sean mentioned that I think is uh, very interesting to me is he had mentioned the, the need for a modern-day uh, desegregation plan. And, and I, I think there's a, a lot of a promise there. Um, partly because we have a changing environment in education policy, even though uh, states are, are very active in this space. And uh, we could think, for example, of a couple things that could help out really tremendously, particularly given the prevalence of school choice in the, in, uh, in the United States. One is simple transportation. We talked about that in, in earlier. Um, but for those students who do want to choose to go to another school, and lots of times transportation is not made available, I think that could go a long way. And second is taking advantage of choice choice in, in a more positive way. Um, there was tremendous move, movement and advancements with magnet schools in the United States, which are flagship schools located in neighborhoods that promoted integration. And uh, I, I think more and more of those settings could be helpful as well. And sometimes it's not just a case I'd of like distance as well, that. is it? Sorry, Patricia, I'll get back to you. David, we have a school That's district in Mississippi. You have one school, which is 100% black, another school in the same district, which is 90% white, they are separated by, guess what, railway tracks. Well, I think in those cases, for example, a, a flagship school that is, is very high quality academics, that is located in a place that is accessible, for example, to uh, black students in that community as well as white students in that community, I, I think that those are, are very successful uh, potential options as school districts look to think about it integrating and, and finding really creative ways to bring, to bring communities together. Right. Uh, my daughters attend a magnet school. It's a very diverse school, and it attracts students from the local Local, local area, more, more of a depressed area of Phoenix, but it also attracts families from other places. And truth is, I believe both the community and the families benefit from the integration. Patricia? Yeah, we also know uh, from other studies that families that send their children to desegregated schools are really quite happy with that opportunity. And actually, many families are seeking that opportunity and cannot find it. I just want to add that Many of our, among Latino students, the majority are children of immigrants, yeah. and as well as other immigrants that we have. These children bring tremendous assets with them to school. They, they bring cultures, they bring languages that are needed in our economy. And there are ways to desegregate by doing more dual language schools and mm. using international baccalaureate programs to allow these students to take high level courses. Right. So, and these are things that can include all children, um, black, white, Asian, and Latino. Corinne, very quickly, and we have seen very seconds. successful programs. 
We've right. seen very successful programs in Arizona that desegregate that are language both focused or international baccalaureates. Okay, very quickly, Corinne, I've got a few seconds left. Can integration be achieved voluntarily or do we need some laws to be put in place and some rules? Um, I, I think we need some rules. Yeah. We, we, we have to be able to push the envelope and kind of force some mm -hmm. things to happen. Um, but with that also said, we also have to do more in supporting students to be successful in those environments. Possibly revisiting Brown versus the Board of Education? Possibly. Okay. Possibly.